Okay, so what we did last time, we took a, a particularly simple system. We took a, 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 a bunch of mass points and turned it into a string. And the, we ended up with a Lagrangian. Well, let's, let me write the action out, actually. The action was the integral dt times the Lagrangian, which was the integral dx of one half, one over v squared d phi dt squared minus d phi dx squared, which is equivalent to saying the wave equation. Okay, that's just the wave equation. You know, so you could re do this in reverse. You could, you say the wave equation. Let's say you know phonon satisfy wave equation. You can work backwards. Here's the action. Okay, it'd be d3x in the case of phonons. However, more to the point for the class is we derive from that the quantization conditions. Phi of x and t commuted with pi of x prime and t equaling i h bar delta of x minus x prime. Okay pi was, was the variation of the Lagrangian with respect to phi dot. Okay. okay, and so that's that's our key piece, our key quantum piece. And the part about these being equal times will be explained today. That's I, I, one of my units today. Okay. We solved that by writing the, the the field in discrete notation here, phi of x and t is sum over s. S are going to be the the normal modes, the waves on the string. Some normalization e to the minus i uh, omega s t minus k s x. A of S plus the Hermitian conjugate, which is either the plus I, same stuff, A dagger of S. Okay. And to satisfy the commutation rules, the, the feature you have to choose A of S a dagger of s equals, I'm oh sorry, s prime, one is s prime, delta s s prime. So this, this looks like the usual number operators. And associated with that, there's a, a, you have to choose the normalization. It's h bar v squared over 2 omega s l. Okay, so that has to be done. Now, just not to, uh, to belabor the point, but in deriving this, I did choose a normalization of what I chose to be phi. If I had taken phi to be twice as big, I'd still get the wave equation out. So there's a sort of a convention chosen there. It's a standard convention. But it actually ends up not making a difference at all because this guy normalizes it. So all the stuff that we'll derive after this will still be the same, like the Hamiltonian that we're about to get, will still be the same independent of whatever normalization conventions I chose. Because if I chose, if I diff chose a different normalization of my Lagrangian, then pi would be different, in, but th the conditions would be the same. So that forces it to always work out the way it does. You know, some, some changes down here. I could have chosen this to have a factor of two, then this would have a factor of two in it, things like that. In the end, I, I don't really want to demonstrate that, but it, in the end, none of that matters. All of, the, all of the, the key results are independent of it, though some of these conventions along the way depend. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to say a little bit more about the Hamiltonian because there's some interesting pieces in there. So the Hamiltonian, 
So we also derived the Hamiltonian last time is the integral dx, 1 half, 1 over v squared d phi dt squared plus d phi dx squared. Okay, and if I just start plugging into that, there's the integral dx, 1 half integral f, sum over s and s prime, one, there's phi squared, so there's a, two different phi's, two different summations. There's some normalizations. And then in phi dot, you get 1 over v squared. So the first term has 1 over v squared. And there's a minus i omega s minus i omega s prime. OK, so we're, we're using the expansion that sits up there. Minus i omega comes from time derivatives. And then stuff looks like this. E to the uh, minus i stuff. Um, a minus e to the plus i stuff, a dagger, and then the same type of things with primes on it. Okay, so again, I'm not going to do all this, all the tiny little details on it, but I want to point out a few things. So that's the first term. The second term comes with um, i k s i k prime or k of s prime. Okay, and then again, the same type of things there. Okay, well, what happens? Well, there are two types of terms that you, that you see there. When you do this integration over x, we're interested in the integration over x next. I've got s and s prime here, so there's a e to the i k dot x and k prime dot x. So I would have terms that look like the integral dx, e to the i k s x, e to the minus i k s prime x. Right? So that becomes, these are chosen to be orthonormal. So there's a delta ks, uh, ks prime. And there's a factor of l, because this integration runs over the whole length of it. I'm using box normalization. Okay. The other term that comes out is the same thing, dx. But I could have here the same sign, you know, so if I'm taking the a times the a piece, I get something that looks like e to the i k s x, e to the i k s prime x. Okay, so if I'm looking at a times a, they both have e to the i k s. No, no change in sign. Okay, so that's the same thing, but it's delta k s minus ks prime. Okay. So given, so in both these cases, um, omega s prime is omega s for both of them. But in one case, it's plus you know, ks. In the other case, it's minus ks. Okay. So what happens here? Well, we end up at the next step with the following. So we've done the x integration. The Hamiltonian is, well, there's a half from the sits in front. There's a sum over s. The normalizations turn into h bar v squared over 2 omega s l. Okay. There's an, an L times the integration in the thing. And then we get the following. We get two types of terms. We get minus 
homing f squared over v squared um, plus ks squared with terms that look like a a of s a of let's call it minus s it means that ks is backwards yes no it's, it's because these guys are the, are, are the same up to a minus sign okay so if the if the wave numbers are the same then the frequencies are the same and so one is one of these says that ks prime is minus KS. So it's just going in the opposite direction, okay? um, which it has the same omega then. Okay. So there's, there's always the, the relation, which I didn't emphasize there, was that omega F is KS times V, magnitude of KS. Okay? So it's just, okay. so that's, that's why they're both the same. Anybody else? Okay, but if you think, if you look at the, if you look at the uh, terms that, that sit up that were up there with two a's, they both have the same sign on omega. So there's an e to the minus two i omega t sitting in front of that, and there. There's a e plus 2i omega t in front of the a daggers. So th those are two of the four terms that appear. And then the other two terms that appear are omega s squared over v squared plus ks squared, which is a of s a dagger of s. Actually, one of these is minus s. Sorry, let's back up here. I missed the minus sign there. Minus s. Should go in there. I'll stick it in there. There. Got it in. Okay. And a dagger of s, a of s. In brackets. These guys, when you're doing 1a and 1a dagger that has e to the plus i omega t, e to the minus i omega t, they cancel. Okay, okay so that's what I get. So those are my four terms. There's a, okay, and at this stage, you see that these guys now cancel. It's, it's, it's not a miracle, but it's, it's, it might look like it when you're calculating. The, these two terms here cancel because omega is kv. Um, so all the time dependence drops out. So there's no time dependence. The Hamiltonian is time independent. And um, The uh, well, like, and, and, and all these off-diagonal pieces drop out. Okay, and that's that happens all the time in when when you form the Hamiltonian by Lagrangian techniques. The off-diagonal pieces disappear, which is fine, and it's time independent. Time independence is you can argue easily. Okay, and if you collect up the remaining things here. There's, this is, these two are equal here. The v squared cancel. The factor of two cancels because there's two there. One of the omegas cancels. It's h bar omega. The l's cancel. A miracle occurs. And the Hamiltonian is h bar omega sum over s. h bar omega s. It's one half a s, a dagger of s, plus a dagger of s, a of s, which these things have commutation rules, and so you put them in the usual form. It sits, looks like, sum over s, 
h bar omega a dagger of s a of s plus a half, which we could call as h0 plus e0. e0 is the, the zero point energy get to say more about that. That's the one half h bar omega s summed over s. Okay, so that's that comes out. That's just a constant. The rest of it is is more important physics. This is the number operator. Okay, a dagger a. So this is, we're using our, Hamilton, our harmonic oscillator intuition. And so we would just take, you know, H0 is sum over S, H bar omega S. Okay, so there's our solution. But this, this is the solution. Now we, we know the quanta. We know the spectrum. The spectrum Maybe it's not that surprising. So here we've we've got the string up here. We've got various normal various modes of the string. And for each type of wave there, the energy is h bar omega. So there's this is omega one. This is omega two. And you keep going down. There's all these different potential the different energy states. H bar omega is the energy. Okay. So the lowest state is one that has no excitations of any of these modes. Okay. So there's no omega ones, there's no omega two, it's just a plain old string. Okay. So we would denote that by zero 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 which is just simplified zero. Okay. This means no omega one excitations. Uh, the second one means no omega two. Okay. If you want to put a single quanta in there, All right, actually, let's, let's, um, let's say a little bit more about this briefly here. If I want H0 on this state to be 0, that implies that I want A, A of S on this state to be 0. So they not, this, this, if we identify this with an annihilation operator like we do in the harmonic oscillator, there's no quanta of type S in there. Okay, so there's, or, you know, or a dagger, a, yes. so there's no quanta, there's, a number, there's none of these guys. So a single quanta, we, we can create by doing the following. We take um, a dagger of some mode, let's call it one, on this state. And that would that would end up being described by one quanta there, zero and two, zero there, et cetera. And then when you act on this thing with a Hamiltonian, H zero acting on one is the following. Okay, so I've got this this calculation is there's going to do a bunch of these little painful calculations to start with, just so we get fluent with this. Hamiltonian to sum over S, A dagger S, A S, and it's acting on the state that's A dagger 1 on 0. 
Okay. Now, we, uh, maybe you're fluent enough you can just write the answer out for this without doing anything. But here's, here's the logic be behind getting fluent at it. Okay. Remember, if s is not equal to 1, then these two things commute. You know, when, when, when they're not the same value, then they commute. There was a delta of SS prime in the commutation rules, so they commute when they're not the same quantity. So whenever this is not equal to 1, this, this can be brought through the A dagger, it's an operator, act on the, the, this empty space, and it gives 0. So there's no, there's no quant of any s except for 1. So you just take the s equals to 1 case. So we take, we have h bar omega 1, a dagger of s, a, no, a of 1, 1, a dagger of 1. Okay, and to evaluate this, we, we note that this guy can be written as Let's drop the one for the moment. A, a dagger, commutator, plus a dagger a on the empty state. Right. So it's just by adding a dagger, adding and subtracting a dagger a. This term gives zero. The a, because a acting on that gives zero. This term gives one, and we b end up back with h bar omega one, a dagger one, one zero. So it's done its counting job. It's counted that there's one quanta there, it should, and it come back with the number one. Okay. So in a sense, it's we're just it's, it's a bookkeeping device. There, you can have multi-quanta too. You know, if you wanted to put two quanta uh, you could put two zero, 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 et cetera, like that. That's one over the square root of two. This is a normalization factor. A dagger one, a dagger one on the empty state. Or you can put the quanta in different places. You can put one there, one there. It would just be a dagger one, a dagger two. They commute to the order doesn't matter on the empty state. And the, the number operator counts these things. So this one is uh, h0 on this. This guy is 2h bar omega times the guy back again. This one is H0 on this guy is omega H bar omega 1 plus H bar omega omega 2. Sorry about the sloppiness there on that state. Okay. So all our harmonic oscillator techniques can be put in this. And we now know every state. And they miraculously satisfy quantum mechanics rules for, for states on waves. Um, this, these states here, the notation is, or the name is Fox space. If you hear Fox space, what that means is it's the states identified by the number of particles at given energies. It doesn't have to be plane waves. It can be any states. But you, it's a number representation. You count, count how many in each state. That's how you identify the states. That's your basis state. OK. Questions? We're, we've quantized. We've, we've now got the, the first whole quantized field. OK. There's no questions I want to answer. Two questions that, that we're there. Or
y equal time commutators. We got this one last week. Sven asked it. Okay. So we we had derived phi of x t phi of x prime and t is I h bar delta x minus x prime. And we have insisted that these guys be the same time. Okay? And the answer comes from usual quantum mechanics. It's actually true that this is actually happens in normal quantum mechanics also. So I'd like you to recall the pictures of quantum mechanics. Okay. So we most often start teaching the Schrodinger picture. See, in the Schrodinger picture, the operators are time independent. You know, so there's um, Q hat S, P hat S, some op and some operator in this frame. These carry no time dependence. But the states carry the time dependence. You have psi of t is e to the minus i h t, t over h bar psi of 0. Okay. We then make a deal of saying, well, there's also the Heisenberg picture. In the Heisenberg picture, the states are time independent. And you get you get to them by taking phi Heisenberg is e to the um, plus i h t phi Schrodinger sorry, sorry. which ends up removing the time dependence. Okay, you've got uh, okay. And the operators carry it then. So um, you take some operator in the Heisenberg picture, the function of time is e to the i h t over h bar. Operator in the Schrodinger picture, e to the minus i h t over h bar. And matrix elements are all the same then. You know, all the observables are the same. Okay. So, and then it was just completed, then it take questions. The third picture is the interaction picture. It's a little of each. Here you, you break up H is H0 plus H interaction. And then your states, your states, the psi in the interaction picture carry time dependence, which is e to the uh, plus I H 0 T over H bar psi Schrodinger. And the, the states Okay, and, and operators also carry H0, so O hat interaction is e to the i H0 T over H bar.
and the states evolve in time is with some time development operator which depends on H interaction. Okay, so that if H interaction is zero, the, this is time independent, but otherwise not. Okay, we w I will ask you if you, if this is fuzzy, to review the interaction picture. Because that's going to be our basis for perturbation theory. We'll, we'll get the Feynman rules of field theory out of the interaction picture. But the basic point for this stage is that, is that we're implicitly in the Heisenberg picture. Okay, the derivation that I did, we had yj of t, and that went into phi of x and t. So our, when we quantized, y and p depended on time, so the operators depended on time. Now, this is almost forced on you in field theory. So let's, let me call it natural in field theory. Okay. The reason it's natural is because we have to have something that's a function of x. If it satisfies the wave equation, which you'd like it to do, then it's going to be a function of time. So it's your field variables are naturally functions of x and time, and especially once you get into relativity. If it's a function of x and you boost it, it's a function of time also. So it's pretty hard to formulate field theory without having your dynamical variables, your fields, be functions of time. That's okay. That's, we just have to realize that. The, the states also that we had out there, our states are just, our states, you know, our states n were a dagger of some s on an empty state. That's independent of time. There's no explicit time dependence there. So that that's also looks like a Heisenberg picture. Okay. So what we've really done is we've done doing this in the Heisenberg picture. And what you may not have realized is that the commutation rules even for ordinary quantum mechanics, are at equal time in the Heisenberg picture. Okay? And you can sort of see that. If I have q hat i of t, p hat uh, j of t, so these are two different coordinates, commuted, that turns into e to the I H T over H bar Q I hat minus I H T over H bar commuted with E to the I H T P hat E to the minus I H T H bar which, if I've chosen these times to be the same, then whenever I do this, I get the intermediate ones canceling out becomes either the, either the plus i h t over h bar q hat with the, sh the usual Schrodinger ones. Is then the usual commutation rule. Okay, so you get a delta ij there, and the Hamiltonians disappear, and you get the usual things. But q hat i of t, p hat j of t prime is not equal to ih bar delta ij if t 
not equal to t prime. Because you can see, if one of these was t and the other one was t prime, there's a Hamiltonian that sits in front of it, between there that carries p and p's and q's in it. So you no longer get your commutation rules out. Okay. So equal time commutators are required in the Heisenberg and also the interaction picture. And that's why we get them, because that's, that's how it came out. Okay, good enough on that. The other thing I just want to point out is another view of what we've done. And that has to tie up to classical normal modes. Okay. Okay, remember when we do classical normal modes, we have some over j, m, you know, some coordinate j dot squared plus some v of, of the coordinates. And we very generally, you know, so you, this could be bunches of pendulums. You know, it could be anything. It can, you know, be the the Qualls problem from last uh, last last week, right? And we always just solve this thing classically. But if we were asked to quantize it, how would we proceed? Okay. Well, here's how here's how you proceed. You know, you when you do normal modes, you expand this thing in small oscillations. One, half, the potential is written as v i j q i qj. You look for the eigenvalues of this, so you get the determinant of m minus omega squared v equals zero to get get the the eigenvalues. You identify your your normal your normal modes with some um, uh, I, don't know, I typically call this the modal matrix. So these C's are your normal modes, Q's were your original modes. And the effect of this has been to decouple the harmonic oscillators. And be, actually, let's make that S just to make my notation the same. Sum over S, one half C S dot squared minus one half omega S squared C S squared. So if you if you go to the normal modes, you get these decoupled harmonic oscillators. And now you know how to quantize this. You take P sub S is the variation of the Lagrangian with respect to C sub S dot. And you do um, C sub S P sub S prime IH bar delta S S prime. Okay, so we we most often on the calls don't ask you to quantize these things. We just ask you to find the normal modes. But there is a there is a sneaky problem that I put on in the past, and it appears every every you know six years or so, where we give you a problem that's that's two particles in a coupled potential, and ask you to quantize it. And the trick is you have to decouple it because by the normal modes trick and then quantize it. Okay? So if you were asked to quantize it. But the lesson from this, I, I'm after the lesson, is, is that you solve for the normal modes and then quantize. And in field theory, the normal modes
are the plane waves. You know, the e to the i k dot x, kx. They're the states of definite energy, so you quantize them and you get the usual quantization rule. So this, this leads to a phrase that you sometimes hear, hear, that a field is an infinite number of harmonic oscillators. So there's a, there's a catchy abbreviation. <laughs> infinite number of harmonic oscillators is, is what a field is all about. Everybody comfortable with that? Any questions about what, what we've got there? If there's not, I, I'm going to quickly redo it in continuum notation. Um, I did this in this discrete notation. You know, I imagine putting up boundary conditions. You could actually, if you wanted to do the normal modes problem, you could have a small number of with boundary conditions, a small number of oscillators. For field theory, you take a continuum limit in between the boundaries, but we also just take plain old plane waves, like photons. We have to quantize photons. We don't always put them in a cavity, so let's take them out of the cavity. I'll do continuum normalization now. It's a little, it's basically just a lesson in uh, going to continuum notation. I'm also going to go to 3D. So continuum and 3D. There's, there's not, but it's basically the same problem. So in the 3D problem that would be like this is phonon. Okay, you have this big three-dimensional solid. You at the microscopic level, you've got little atoms bumping into each other, but you know that there's a, a wave that propagates through. It's a density wave. The density wave um, is just a, doesn't carry any, any direction itself except it's momentum flowing. So it, it satisfies the wave equation. It's just like the, the one we had before. You would, you would write out the action is the integral dt d3x, uh, one, one, one half, one over v squared, d phi dt squared minus del phi squared. That gives you the 3D wave equation when you, when you do the action principle. Okay. And the, again, the normalization won't change the, the states. But now let's, let's say you, you're, you just want to have describe these by continuum fields. We're going to label the states by P is H bar K. The solutions will be phi of x and t to satisfy the wave equation, integral d3 p 2 pi q, or actually, I'm going to put 2 pi h bar cubed, some normalization of p. Uh, e to the minus i omega t minus k dot x a of p plus e to the plus i omega t minus k dot x a dagger of p. And what I would really write here, which is exactly the same thing, I. I'll just call this e to the minus i e t minus p dot x over h bar. 
Okay. E is h bar omega, p is h bar k, so it's exactly the same thing. Okay. Um, now, putting the 2 pi here and putting the h bar q there is both conventions that, that gets, just changes what I mean by the normalization here. But of course I use this one because this is a standard one in statistical mechanics also. There's, there's one particle in phase, one particle in every 2 pi h bar unit of phase space, so there's a, a, a convention of putting h bars there. At least I follow that convention. But it's just a convention. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to. But if you do that, there's our normalization choice. We have A of P, A dagger of P prime. Okay, it's going to be chosen to be 2 pi H bar delta 3 of P minus P prime. And I'm sorry, this is pi h bar cubed. And again, there are other choices that one can make. That's, that's the one I, I choose to make. Um, in that case, n of p turns out to, in order to satisfy the commutation rules, phi with pi has to be h bar v squared over 2 omega p. It's the same thing as we had before, except there's no length factor there. But this, this, this then follows from phi with pi is i h bar and delta x, 3 of x minus x prime. And if you work it out, I mean, I, I, I have the, the stuff worked out here. It's the case. Okay. If you do this, then the Hamiltonian is integral d3 p 2 pi h bar cubed h bar omega. At the early stage, I write it as a dagger p a of p plus a of p a dagger of p. Okay. Okay. So I uh, clearly will c commute them. That's that's with no work. That's just that's just taking the Hamiltonian as we normally found, turning the crank, the a dagger a dagger pieces drop out, etc. Just like before. This is what I get left with. At this stage, you rewrite it integral d three p two pi h bar cubed h bar omega. Um, Right, this is h. Let's call this h zero plus e zero again, where the one is a dagger of p, a of p. So this is h zero, and the the um, e zero, the zero point energy, is integral d three p, two pi cubed h bar h bar omega, one half, so the one half is there. And what happens when I commute this? Well, I commute it, I normally get a delta 3 of p prime minus p, but p prime is p, so this turns into 2 pi 
h bar cubed delta 3 of 0. All right. So this is the good guy. That's the piece we're after. This again is our zero point energy. It's it's pretty divergent. It's, it's doubly divergent. One divergence is that we sum over p times h bar omega. That's divergent. That's just, that's in a sense, you might think is excusable because it's an infinite number of harmonic oscillators. There's, they go to infinity, there's one half h bar omega per oscillator. So you have an infinite number of them, you're going to diverge. This guy looks worse. Here's a delta 3 of 0. This actually is, is a volume. If you think about what is, uh, delta 3 of p is integral d, uh, no, yeah, d3 x e to the i p uh, dot x. Right there, there's a delta, delta 3 of p. I guess I need some 2 pi cubes. So there's, there's a, a factor there. And if p goes to 0, this is just the volume. So this is the volume of space-time. So in some sense, that's, that's actually more, more uh, understandable. This just says that, that there's some energy density, zero-point energy density, and then there's the volume of space-time. Zero-point energy density is a constant. But even if you took E0 over V is also divergent. That's, that's the one that's the infinite number of oscillators. Okay. I will also return and talk about this some more because it's a fun topic. Um, if you don't like it, you might like to have the in the end, the number of bosons and fermions in the world be the same because you'll find out that the same thing for, for fermions has the opposite sign. So once this is a boson, the, the, this phonon field here is a bonon, boson. But that's, that's what it is. That's what the formalism tells us. Okay. So we'll come back and do some more on that. If we do about states, The states are found by, you know, let's call it P1 is a dagger of P1 on an empty state. There's, there's A of P on the empty state equals zero for P. So again, you have an empty state, you have a, the one particle states. When I do H zero on this P one. Well, maybe it's worth writing this out just to see a little bit to see how the all the bad stuff disappears. I have integral d three P two pi H bar cubed H bar omega of P A dagger of P a of p, a dagger of p1 on the empty state. Okay, so the first part of this, that part over there is the Hamiltonian. This part's the state. I do the same sort of trick as before. I try commuting these guys. I write this as a of P, a dagger of P prime, P1, sorry, plus a dagger of P1, A of P, 
all acting on the empty state. There are no states P here. A of P acting on that gives zero, so that guy gives zero. This guy gives 2 pi h bar cubed times delta 3 of p minus p1. And so I end up, so th those guys have disappeared. I have a dagger p1. I end up with just plain old h bar omega 1 p1. Okay. So all the bad, bad stuff disappeared. And I just get enough of the energy like I expected. And I guess the last thing I need to show you here is the normalization. Okay. If we do P1, P2, uh, 0, A of P1, A dagger of P2, 0. Right, so those, if I have two states, P1 and P2, this is the state P2. If I take a state like that and permission conjugated, becomes 0 a. So this becomes a instead of a dagger now. And then these guys also get written. I do the same trick here. I have a of p, a dagger. I write it as the, the commutator times um, the plus this guy. This guy gives 0 when acting on the empty state. This turns into then 2 pi h bar cubed delta 3 p minus p 1 minus p 2. Okay, so your states don't are normalized to 1 to normalize to this funny delta function. Okay, that's typical continuum stuff. Okay, so everyone that's that's in some sense just technology. Let's just come back and talk about what we did. I'm happy to take questions on technology though if you want. Okay. What we've done the the phrase for what we've done is canonical quantization. Okay, and in canonical quantization, the field becomes an operator. Okay, now that sounds sounds very scary, and the, and the the hope is to make it not so scary for you. Okay, in some sense, you've lived through this already. You know, you've you've taken coordinates and momentum, x and p, and live through the fact that in quantum mechanics you get told that these things become operators. So they're not just a measurement or a ruler, they're some operator in some silly Hilbert space. And you live through that. You'll live through this too, okay? The photon field becoming an operator is, it sounds very exotic. It actually turns out to not be so exotic. So the purpose of this little unit here is to make it seem not quite as exotic. Uh, but I should also say that, that there's also another way of doing it, which is path integral quantization. Which we will do in this course. Where the field is just a number. The field is just a field. number. Number is a function of x and t. You know, so you, each point in space-time has ha, ha, is given a number. That's a field. 
Okay. And so in pathogenic quantization, there's none of this operator, but there is no operators. Okay, so in some ways it's a much more satisfying way to, to deal with it. The trouble with path integral quantization is it's actually very hard to understand what your states are. Okay, so if you take any field theory book that goes immediately to um, path integral quantization and you try, to, you try to pinpoint where they define where their states are, you know, the state, the, the state of a momentum with energy h bar omega. It's very hard to, to identify that in a path integral treatment. And there's always this place where it gets a little fuzzy and you say, this looks just like a scattering amplitude. Or, you know, so, so you end up with Green's functions very naturally. So there's a way to get to Green's functions and things like that. And you put together a bunch of Green's functions and you throw away the propagators on the outside and this looks like a scattering amplitude. Okay? That step is always mistreated in a field theory book that hasn't gone through canonical quantization. So that's, it's, not, it's, it's nice to do as beautiful formalism. We'll do it, but we'll do it after we have a sense of what the states are and how, how transitions occur and the absolute normalization of all these transitions. Okay, so that's our logic for doing it this way. Questions? Okay, so the field always has this this quantum the quantum field always has two parts. Okay, and we we've seen that here. One part is something that you would call the wave function, and the other is the these the other part is the creation and annihilation operators. And these two parts have different roles. You know, all the dynamics lives in the wave function. I'm oh, sorry. So what the states are lives there. I want you to start thinking about the operator part as just bookkeeping. And we'll do that. Okay. So we will see that when, let's imagine where we end up going, for example, let's take some scattering. We take an electron coming in this way, a proton coming in this way. The physics is that they, they scatter and go off to some other final states. Okay. The, the wave function part of it will give you the amplitude for the incoming state, the amplitude for the outgoing state, and your transition amplitude will then be some some number that involves that initial wave function, outgoing wave function. That's, that tells you how big the scattering amplitude is. What the creation and annihilation operators are going to do is there, when you take this matrix element, we will have some w creation and annihilation operators. The annihilation operators will remove the guys in the initial state, create the guys in the final state. So you, you'll have some initial state, which be some momentum, you know, momentum one, momentum two, those guys get removed and in, they're replaced by guys going in the outgoing state that we want momentum three and momentum four. So that's how a scattering amplitude is going to happen. The, the creation and annihilation operators are going to disappear from the final answer. They're going to be gone when you take a matrix element, but they do the bookkeeping. They tell you if we started here, we end there. Then the wave function part tells you how big the amplitude is, what the matrix element is. Okay. So they dis the creation and annihilation operators disappear from the matrix elements. And so, you, you know, once you take matrix elements, you no longer have this craziness of having fields being operators. They're just numbers at the end. And that's why you can get away with having these two, two wildly different ways of doing quantization, one where you have operators and one where you don't. 
So let's just see what we had here. And what we did here, we had phi of x and t. As an example, we have integral d3 p, e to the i, e t minus p dot x over h bar, a of p, you know, plus, plus, plus permission conjugate. Okay, so the wave function for this guy is just the plane wave. Okay. If we were to do something in a cavity, so let's, let's, let's imagine in the cavity, let's imagine it's an electron. We will have, we'll end up doing a phi of x and t. It would be some, some states of normalization, phi n of x and t. If we're doing, if we're doing, well, let me just use uh, the same notation, a n. Okay, and in a sense, we did this in our one-dimensional case. It's sort of like a 1D cavity. We imagine a bunch of normal, you know, standing waves in there. But this could be any case. This could be in a solid. It could be in a, a nucleus. You, you could put up a nucleus. You could make inside the proton and make quarks. So here's your wave function. Here's your creation operators. Okay, and you choose the normalization such that that your quantization rule works out. Okay, so when we take matrix elements, so if I took here's a matrix element phi of x and t, p1. Okay, so there's something we're working up to, some real big ones, but this is, this is uh, something that we could have here. Okay, well, I don't know how much I want to work through it, but phi contains information on, on every state and every wave function. So there's every wave function is built into there, a whole complete set of them. P1 is just one of them. This, this has an A dagger, there's an A there, there's a vacuum there. So A dagger, A vacuum, we know how to do that, right? I don't know. So let me just give you the answer. Um, this is just, turn, turns into the normalization, whatever that normalization was. Uh, e to the minus i uh, e, e t e1 t minus p1 dot x over h bar. It's just a number. So here, there's where the operators have disappeared now, taking this matrix element. This guy in our convention was h bar v squared over 2 omega. Okay. Okay, so you, you always get this wave function back. Okay, but then imagine let's, let's do some transitions. Let's imagine I had P1 coming in here, P2 going out here, and I had phi squared there of X. Okay, so this might be relevant, you know, this is some interaction like psi star psi v, you know, let's imagine we have a Hamiltonian v of x, psi star psi of x. Okay, so v in this case is just a potential psi star psi of z. Well, what this would give, if I play that out, there's two normalizations. There's normalization P1, normalization P2. They always follow. I then get e to the minus i e1t minus p1x over h bar 
either the plus i because it's in the final state e two t minus p two dot x. So there's my wave functions. And if you're if you think about something like this here in the Born approximation of scattering amplitudes, here's e to the i q dot x p minus p prime is q, and you would just end up with some matrix. We'll work out plenty of these, but this is just to show you how the the wave functions get left over, but the creation operators disappear from matrix elements. Okay. Okay, so the, the, we have to build up this, this sense of physical intuition where the creation operators allow different transitions to happen. The overall matrix elements tell you the amplitude for that transition. And that's, we'll, we'll do that a, a lot as we go. That's probably a good place to end this class. Okay. And next time I want more questions. Okay. It can't be that clear.